that's good. Uh, good, we're re officially recording. Sometimes that I forget that part. Um, well, thank you all for joining us uh, for our Faith in the Future installment on talking about the future of youth ministry. And uh, I'm thrilled to have Abigail Russert with us. She's the director of the Institute for Youth Ministry at Princeton Theological Seminary, which is an incredible place, uh, the department. Like there are just some very special places in the life of the church and Princeton IYM is one of them and, and Abigail is one of those special people. So um, it's a perfect match. And uh, so Abigail is the director of the IYM. She's an ordained Presbyterian minister and all around incredible person and uh, has an incredible family. And I'd ask Abigail to come and talk with us um, as part of the transition, as part of our post-COVID life. We're really thinking about what does faith in the future look like in these different ways. Um, and so Abigail was gracious enough to, uh, to join us and, and share um, her learnings and perspective and the work of the IYM with us. So Abigail, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It is a joy to be um, with Upper Dublin Lutheran Church. And just a shout out to Upper Dublin in general, because when I served in congregational ministry prior to taking this role, I was over in Glenside and I coached track and field hockey for the Upper Dublin School District. So I know your kids. So it's, it's an extra special gift for me to be able to talk today and think about your context alongside you. Um, and this post COVID, it's not post really though, right? This <laughs> in new season of COVID that we have just entered um, for those who are just watching the recording, it's, you know, it's a time when the vaccinations are happening and it's your first Sunday back in worship um, in physically together. So it's, actually a pretty exciting time to think about youth ministry and to think about youth ministry maybe in ways that are a little bit outside of the box from how we have thought about it before. So I'm going to share my screen with you. I'll also name as I get my PowerPoint set up here that I also am friendly with and familiar with Lutherans because my husband is a Lutheran pastor and he is the senior pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Doylestown now. So we moved from Glenside over to Doylestown. So I love being able to hang out with Lutherans as often as I can, even as a Presbyterian. I think y'all are a little bit more fun. Don't tell the Presbyterians I said that, but I think you're a little bit more fun than the stodgy, you know, Presbyterians I, I tend to hang out with. <laughs> so, so thank you for being you. And Keith, don't share this video too widely um, <laughs> with me having said that. We'll, we'll edit that part out. <laughs> okay, great, great. <laughs> yeah, cut that out. Um, well, I want to talk to you today about a hinge, a place where two concentric circles meet. And that for me is youth ministry and innovation. And I'll first give you a sense of, I want to invite you a little bit on a journey that I have been through for the last three years in some of my work with the Institute for Youth Ministry. I wanna give you the sense of a project that we have worked on at the IYM around youth ministry and innovation. It's been really a national research project and we've worked with lots of churches. I also want to share with you today some thoughts and some input from the incredible folks with whom I work at Princeton Seminary, specifically Kenda Creasy Dean. Um, now, I don't know, Livy or Regan, if either of you were blessed to work on the Zoe project um, with Pastor Keith, but maybe you've heard some, some murmurs about it at your congregation. Maybe some folks who are watching later have been involved in the Zoe project. Um, all that's to say, I know y'all are a creative bunch because of who your pastor is <laughs> and also um, because of who your congregation has been in the life of the work at Princeton Seminary through the Zoe project. And the work that I have done is not too far um, afield from the work that the Zoe project has taken on over the last few years. We're going to do a creative exercise today, whether it's two of us. And for those watching later, you're invited to do it in real time with us. Um, you'll see that I give you a little bit of time to, from when we start the project to when you need to sort of report in about the project. So you can do this even if it's just on a recording. Um, and then you're gonna get a homework assignment. I know that's not really a great thing to say at the top of a, a time together, but I think it'll be really fruitful and generative for you. It's the assignment is you get to listen to something. So you can go on a walk. You don't have to sit in front of a screen. You're gonna be able to listen to something. It's about a 40 minute podcast episode um, that I'll assign you as, as your homework. And I hope that all of that 
creative juices flowing for um, UDLC to think a little bit um, more deeply and a little bit wider about maybe what you could do in this next season, this opportunity that we've been handed to think afresh about working with and ministry with young people. Okay, so first I want to introduce for you this project that I have been working on. I'm curious, um, and Regan, you don't have to unmute yourself, you don't have to turn your video on, but I just want you to think if you've ever heard of the Log College. Now, if you are any, I know you all are in Montgomery County, but over in Bucks County, there's this really well-known historical um, place called the Log College. Now it has since gone away, but there's Log College, um, middle school and there's William Tennant High School. These are names that might be a little bit familiar to you just because of the area that you're in. Um, but I'll tell you the story real quick and you can see the program outline on your screen. So you can see a little bit of this program we've turned into the Log College project, but I wanna tell you the story of the Log College. So I'll actually, just so it's less distracting, I'm gonna go back. The Log College was really a pastor an Episcopalian who ended up getting friendly with the Presbyterians in Philadelphia in the 1720s, um, early 1720s, and maybe even arguably sooner than that. His name was William Tennant. He got friendly with the Presbyterians, finally got sort of in and said, okay, they ordained him, they blessed him as a Presbyterian minister. And he realized that one of the needs um, happening in Bucks County at that time in, in uh, Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, you know, at that time, was they needed to train more people for ministry. There were a lot of uh, folks who were really interested in faith and they needed more pastors. And the only place, places that a pastor could get trained at that time was Yale and Harvard. So this guy, William Tennant looked around and he said, you know what, there's a lot of young people here who could do this, who could become pastors. Why don't we set up a school? So he built a 20 by 20 foot log cabin and started training people for ministry, specifically young people. And the thing that was different about it is he actually really did life with these young people. It wasn't a school where you'd come and you'd learn and then you would go home again. The whole idea was community building, supporting one another, being involved with each other's lives outside of the classroom. Um, that deep and rich sense of belonging that I think is just innately part of our, our, our wiring as human beings, wanting to belong to something, wanting to belong to other people and groups. So um, it ended up being called the Log College in contempt by the Philadelphia Presbytery. Actually, he caused a huge schism in the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> um, people were coming out of this education and they were told that they weren't really legitimate pastors because they hadn't gone to Yale, they hadn't got to, gone to Harvard. And, uh, and it ended up being a huge point of contention for the Presbyterian Church really in the, in the early 1700s. Uh, lo and behold, over time, some of those graduates from the Law College ended up being some of the most fiery preachers in the Great Awakening. And many of them went on to found institutions in this country of higher learning, including Dickinson College is one of them. If you drive on 263 today, which I know heads down through Hatboro and over to where y'all are, you can take 263 up to, toward us in Doylestown. There's a Dunkin' Donuts, right after you pass the Dunkin' Donuts, look on your left, and there's this cruddy old little monument. It's not cruddy, it's, it's a big stone pretty monument, but in a kind of a cruddy spot. And uh, on that monument is a list of all these institutions that William Tennant and his Law College graduates founded. And one of them is Princeton University, which of course turned into Princeton Theological Seminary. So the story of the Law College is the history of youth ministry innovation for Princeton Theological Seminary. It's a pastor who saw promise in young people and decided to work with them instead of just giving information to them to really change the landscape of um, what, what uh, faith was like in uh, that time in the early 1700s. So if a pastor can get a few, and the, the, it existed for about three or four years, I don't think it was around very long, but if a pastor can gather young people together and cause a great awakening, why can't Upper Dublin Lutheran Church gather young people together do ministry with them maybe differently than other folks are doing it, whether it's Yale, Harvard, or the church down the street. And um, who knows what God might do with that? Who knows uh, what, what flames the Holy Spirit might fan um, with that kind of ministry? So my hope today is that this work can inspire you towards something like that. 
Okay, so here's the program. I'm not gonna like bore you with all the details of the program, but you can see that there's a journey that we go on in the Log College Project. It includes things like um, an application process, a work tree, um, a community blueprint process. We're gonna dig into this more deeply in just a moment. If you think about it, like we sent these, you see these design boxes here. We sent these literal, literally they look like pizza boxes. We would send them to your church. You open them up and there's curriculum. It takes eight weeks. There's projects that you do. You work with an intergenerational team. You involve young people. There's gatherings, things like design summits. Um, there's digital courses, an online course you can see right here. And then there's a culmination of all of this in an event we call the Design Lab, where congregations all gather together with their young people and they all design new forms of ministry. And they design it. The, the thing that makes it youth ministry is not that we're popping out with all these interesting programs for young people. It's that young people have joined not so young people and together they have designed new programming. Now that could be for anyone, for whatever needs are going on in your community. The thing that makes it youth ministry is that young people are doing ministry with you. So in the Log College Project, when we first launched it, we had 200 applicant churches. We collected a bunch of information and data from those churches. And I'll share a little bit of that, of our learnings with you in just a moment. We had 50 churches who did this design box, this blue printing box, eight weeks together. We sent boxes out. Um, they worked in intergenerational teams and they did a lot of research about their area, um, their community, the needs present in their community and the passions of young people, where young people even are in their community. That's not too far afield from what the Zoe Project had y'all did with young adults. And then we worked with 12 churches specifically, and that was a three-year journey with those 12 churches. And we did a really deep dive to help them design something new. There were multiple denominations, including one Lutheran church, and teenagers were active on all these teams. Okay, this is the slide you should never share at an event like this, because it's too wordy. But I wanted to, at the very least, give you a snapshot this is, uh, I mean, beyond the tip, 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 tip of the iceberg of what we're learning through this work um, with congregations all over the country. And don't worry, our, um, our task is coming up and we're gonna give you a task in just a minute. Religious organizations, one thing we learned is that religious organizations, so that includes churches like UDLC, should identify the current context of youth ministry and youth ministry's relationship to the culture of young people's daily activities and habits. What this means is, this is a great time um, in, in the season of COVID that we're in to really think through what are we doing? What do we already have for young people? And how does that relate to the culture of what young people are up to right now in this season of the pandemic? The culture of what young people are, in, are involved in, where they quite literally are. Are they in their homes? Are they emerging from their homes? Did that happen a few months ago? What really is going on with young people right now? What are their daily activities? What are their habits? Um, and how do they feel? What are, what are they going through throughout their days? Uh, we're gonna do an activity that gets at this first bullet point in just a minute. We're also learning that innovation in youth ministry requires that leaders listen to young people and also not just listen, but actually invite them. We use the word integrate here, but it's really invitational. Invite young people into more than one um, aspect of your organization. So what you could do is you could get a laundry, you can almost go through your website and say, what do we do as a church that invites young people to the table? How many things do we do as a church? That's, that's one activity you could do sort of based on that second bullet point. Next is we're learning that religious organizations need to create a culture of innovation for youth ministry. Youth ministry models or programs is another way of thinking about a model. Youth ministry programs can't rely on one superstar person. Rather, they require a team of invested people to create new innovative programming. And I would say a step further of that is on that team needs to be teenagers. We're also learning that the leadership of religious organizations, so that's the, the Keiths in the room, right? And it sounds like, um, Livy, this is you too. You know, anyone with a leadership role in an organization needs to recognize that youth ministry is a worthy investment and create a culture of innovation to support um, those new efforts. Now you're already doing that. You're already signaling that for your congregation by having somebody like me um, come and present today. All right, I have to toggle back to my screen here. All right. Last wordy slide. Um, here's uh, among our applicants. So I mentioned that we had 200 churches who applied to work with us. Here's what we noticed and what we gleaned from some of those applications. 
most of our applicants are looking for new models or new programs of ministry. And the majority of them indicated that traditional models like youth groups or Sunday school and worship were among the strengths of what they already do. But one thing, one trend is we noticed that youth are participating in activities for them by adults. So adults sitting in a room saying, what should we do for the young people? And then they decide on something and then they go out and they do it with the young people. Rather than having young people sort of lead the charge um, and, and you know, be at that design table with those adults. Now I'll say I've seen, this is just anecdotally, I've seen congregations um, really kind of turn the tables on this to have it not go so well. Sometimes congregations will just say to the young people, well, what do you want to do with no guidance no outline, no steps to follow, zero mentoring. And then they end up really disappointed when the youth are like, well, what do you mean? So I think there's got to be an ecology, sort of a back and forth of some of the best teamwork. If you go back to the best teamwork you've ever had um, on a project you've worked on, and we all know that it's the hardest kind of work. We never liked it when the teachers assigned us to work with a team, right? When we were in high school, because all, inevitably we were the one on the team who would say, well, now I'm going to have to do all the work, right? <laughs> but if you mine your history for that was one or two examples when that teamwork really was awesome, think about how there were different roles on that team and different skills and strengths brought, brought to the table. And then think about the teenagers you have in your congregation. Which of these teenagers has skills and strengths that could really shine if they were placed on a team and treated as team members, not to bear the burden of coming up with all the answers on the team and also not to sit in the background as a wallflower and never really be involved. But what would it look like to, to work together? We also noticed this was something that was really surprising to us, this final bullet point here. All of the congregations we surveyed, we gave them these, this laundry list of like, what are the spiritual practices that are really resonating with the young people in your congregations? And we took this list of spiritual practices, there must have been 20 of them that we listed out, everything from baptism to um, Bible study to prayer. Uh, and the thing that rose to the top, the tippy tippy top was acts of service and justice was the number one way that congregational leaders identified um, their young people really being passionately involved. And this goes back to a way you can think about this is, have you done a service day project at your church? Have you done a mission trip before, or even a pilgrimage, um, a spiritual formation pilgrimage type trip with your young people? And did you notice that young people really seemed deeply um, impacted by that work and eager to do something like that again? If so, you're not too different from the 200 churches who applied to work with us. They noticed that too, that young people seem very eager to get involved with something that's justice oriented, service oriented, sort of um, cultivating belonging outside of themselves is another way you could think about it. So we would say that that needs to play a significant role in whatever congregations seek to do now in this time period as the pandemic hits this new season and probably even beyond that, uh, that justice focused trends um, are something that I think will continue to take uh, the lead for how young people can be passionately tethered to the work of a local congregation. All right, I wanna check myself on time here. Okay, here we go. So I wanna talk a little bit about that community blueprint and then give you one of the tasks that we did inside of that blueprint with our congregations. So if you remember, this is one of the first things we did. We had 200 churches apply and then 50 of them, we sent this, uh, this job. We sent them a leader guide um, for the leader. And then inside of it, we talked a little bit about what they would do for the next eight weeks with their team. You don't have to read everything on your screen. I don't need to bore you with the details. I'll give all the slides to Keith. You can interrogate them later for all their information. Um, but one of the things that we loved the most that we did were these individual tasks. The individual tasks were meant to be these activities for the leader, the Keith on the team, or maybe even um, the Livy on the team if Livy was in charge of the project. Sometimes we had lay people who were in, in charge of our projects or um, youth pastors or youth directors. Uh, Christian educators of, of different kinds, uh, they would end up giving these individual tasks out to everybody who they were recruiting. So it was really a recruitment tool that we used this for. Because we think, you know, it's hard 
again, to find that, that ecology of a team who's gonna work really well together, those dynamics. So what if we gave you a whole bunch of different tasks and you sent people out to do it and then they came back and you got to, as the leader, evaluate, did people even complete the tasks? <laughs> did they get fired up and inspired? Were there tasks you could that would be better for introverts, tasks better for extroverts, those kinds of things? Um, so I picked one task that we could do together today that is really good for us being distant from each other. And it's based through Zoom, working through Zoom. It's based on this. This is the original one we gave to our folks. We said, we want you to research young people in your community. It's that first bullet point I talked about when I referenced what we're learning. What's the most common activity and average mood of young people under 20 years old, so teenagers really, you could go as young as 12 probably, at the following times of day, 8 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., 5 p.m., 7 p.m. And we sent people out to collect some data around this. So I'm gonna have you do this today. And here's how, I've made it easy for you. Hopefully this is pretty big on your screen and you can move around the video on your screen to a different spot if you need to. If everybody has a cell phone, and even if you're watching later, if you have a cell phone handy, what I would recommend is you take your cell phone and you turn it to your photo function, okay? So you can see that I'm weirdly showing myself on, on the screen right now. And then I want you to flip it around and take a, take a picture of what's on the screen, try to fill it up, but it should be legible with it on your screen, okay? Just take a photo of that. And then I want you to text that photo to two young people you know. Now, if you're starting to sweat and you're like, I don't, I don't have any teenagers I can text in my phone, maybe you know a young adult. Also, think about the people connected to you outside of Upper Dublin Lutheran Church, okay? It doesn't have to be a teenager from your congregation. It could be um, a cousin. It could be a niece or a nephew. It could be a grandkid. It could be um, a babysitter. <laughs> Right? So some young person and two, preferably young people who you know, I want you to text that image to them. And we're just going to test this out. We might get zero responses back. That's going to tell us something. We might get um, responses back really, really quickly. That'll tell us something else. And we're just going to learn something about the young people who we individually as adults represent in this room. Now, if I were Regan, Regan, the other thing you can do is you could maybe take, I saw your kids are kind of little, so they're they're my age. My the ki not my age. Oh my gosh, I'm not your kid's age. They're the age of my children. You could take um, one of your older kids and you could say, hey, here's my phone. Find an emoji. I'm going to open the emojis for you. Find an emoji and tell me how you usually feel when you wake up in the morning. Give me an emoji that represents that. So you can do this with younger children too, if they're in your home and available to you. Um, and if you are against having them be on your phone, <laughs> then you could simply show them this photo that you took and said, pick one, pick one of these emojis. Um, so I'm gonna give you a minute to do that now. And I'll leave this up just for a minute and I'll go silent. So those of you watching this video later, um, you have about one minute to do this task, okay? Maybe you did it while I was talking. If not, you have a minute now. Okay, hopefully we have done our task. And if not, you have this photo in your phone now and you can save it and do it later. Um, and you can sort of bring that information. I encourage you, if you do it later, bring that information back to Pastor Keith and let him know what you learned. That's gonna be really useful for his way forward as y'all dream together about youth ministry and innovation. Are we cool for me to take this down? Uh, yeah, I just want to say I have you know four kids between uh, 17 and 12, and I'm getting emojis back. <laughs> there you go. See, perfect. And you ma it makes it really easy for them to do it really quickly too. You know, yeah. it's like just send me the emoji. I don't want anything else. Yeah, I don't need you to write words for me. Just send me the quick emoji. 
Yeah. I love it. That's Good. So, so hold those because we're going to come back to that in a minute. I love it. Okay. I'm not sure if this will work. So, Pastor Keith, I sent you the audio file earlier. We're going to try it here um, to see if, if it works. But I have an audio clip, and the visuals here will make sense for you as we listen to this audio clip. Um, Hopefully this will be a gift. For those of you who are just sick of your screens, you can, you're gonna have three and a half minutes where you can just look away from your screen and simply listen. You can read um, This is from the beginning that was delivered by Kenda Creasy Dean, the faculty member at Princeton Seminary who I introduced and talked about at the beginning. She is the professor of youth, church and culture at Princeton Seminary. And um, I think what she does in this audio clip is she kind of lays the foundation for the moment. She has really a bird's eye view of what's going on with congregations nationally, internationally. She has worked on countless national projects around youth ministry and innovation. She even launched an organization that helps um, not only congregations, but all organizations work with young people to do innovation. So she's got a, a pretty good grasp on what's the, on going on right now um, with those of us who are serving at the congregational level. And I love sort of the way that she weaves some learnings and kind of sets the stage for why. Why is now a good time to do innovation and think outside of the box around youth ministry? All right, so let's see if this audio clip works. If not, Pastor, give me a thumbs down and then maybe you can run it from where you are. Okay. So this is a familiar story. Um, you, I'm sure no one like it. It's a hot-headed millennial who posts some gripes on a social media wall. I mean, all he was asking for really was a meeting and uh, you know, something about the tone of the post set people off. And you know what happened? It got forwarded to his boss and then that got forwarded to his boss and then that got forwarded to his boss and pretty soon the whole thing went viral. And that is how we got that. The Protestant Reformation. 33-year-old Martin Luther didn't just handwrite those 95 theses and tack them on the Wittenberg door. By all accounts, he was kind of an early adopter of the new technology of the day, which was what? Printing press, right? Um, and he enlisted another young Wittenberg entrepreneur, Johann Grunenberg, who happened to own the new technology, I suppose in his dorm room or something. And not only did they print the 95 theses, but they made copies, right? They had copies of this, which is how Archbishop Albert of Brandenburg and then the theologians at Mainz and then the Pope Leo X and pretty soon most of Germany got their hands on Luther's writing so fast. In fact, Luther went one better and then made a German translation of it. Anyway, like the young adults in our churches, Martin Luther leveraged, he looked at the problems of the church and then he leveraged the technology of his day to try to solve them. Or maybe you've heard of this guy, Emile Leray, 1993. He's a French electrician. He's driving across the desert, Morocco, and he breaks the, well, he gets to a checkpoint that says, do not, pass go. Don't go past here. It's dangerous. And of course he goes past there. And about 20 miles into the desert, he breaks the axle of the car and it's undrivable. And so now he's got a problem. So he can't drive the car. He quickly deems that it's undrivable. He is, he knows the, the terrain pretty well. He's been through this area before, and he knows that he is at least 20 miles from the nearest village. And he knows he can't walk that far. So what are some of his options? What are some things that you think you might do? Throw some out. He can stay with the car. He can pray. He can run. What else? He can hitchhike. Now think about this in terms of what your church would do. If you had, you were aware that there were some rough terrain ahead, you decided to go forward anyway, and then the bottom fell out. What are some options that you might have at your disposal? You could stay with what you're already doing. You could pray, you could run. Okay, so what he does, right? He's got, he's got, what he has in the car is he has, he does have some water with him and he has his um, electrician's tools with him, okay? So what he winds up doing is he takes the um, body off the car and he sleeps under it for a few days, 12 days to be exact. And he 
um, spends the next 12 days reconfiguring the parts of the car to make that. And then he drives it into the nearest town where he promptly gets a ticket for not having a proper motorcycle license, which goes to show you that even if you do hack the resources that you have to come up with something new and innovative, somebody's going to penalize you. for. <laughs> So there you go. I stopped the uh, audio clip at that special spot. <laughs> but um, but this gives us a glimpse into this sort of bird's eye view of, of what's going on in sort of our cultural, societal moment outside of that, just in, in and across the world. Um, there are new tools. And welcome, Sally. I saw you join us. Great to have you. Um, <laughs> there are new tools at our disposal, just like Martin Luther had the printing press at his disposal. There are new tools at our disposal, new resources at our disposal for doing ministry. Um, and yet, and, and there's also some rough terrain. Now, Kenda goes on after this clip to ground folks uh, she's talking to in some scripture. And we are going to go into that scripture. It's First Chronicles to be exact. So I stole this from her. This is not original that we would use First Chronicles. Um, and we're gonna turn there in just a moment. But I think the point for us, especially about um, the story about Emil that kind of shared with this rough terrain and him sort of taking his car into the desert and then finding his way out by using all the tools and resources that he had at his disposal, which was himself, his profession, the, the knowledge that he had, the skill set he had, and also this car. Um, I want us to, to sort of put youth ministry inside of this metaphor. So there's some rough terrain ahead when it comes to youth ministry, and we aren't necessarily in a different boat um, uh, with Emil, who willingly drove his car into that rough terrain. Our impulse, however, as the church is a little different. We are entering into the rough terrain of ministry with young people, not only because we're looking for adventure. I don't really know what, why Emil went into the desert, but I'm assuming it had some, something to do with adventure. And of course, we are looking for that um, in some ways. There's plenty of adventure in youth ministry, but we are moving into rough terrain that engages with very real problems that young people are wrestling with right now. Your youth group kids, um, your own kids, your grandkids, your friends' kids. We're moving toward terrain that includes things like a mental health crisis that was only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this terrain includes, includes incredible amounts of isolation and loneliness and uh, since having a vaccine more widely available, now that may swing us into our own 21st century version of the roaring 20s <laughs> as we sort of emerge and bump into each other in, in the coming months and years. And I mentioned that I used to coach sports in the Upper Dublin School District. And so some of your kids, uh, I think of as my own hometown kids, that they're struggling with wanting to perform to get top grades, to get into the best schools in the area that you live in. They're struggling with eating disorders, um, suicide attempts or suicide attempts by their friends. There's youth homelessness that sits sometimes inside of the Upper Dublin School District, but certainly on the edges of the Upper Dublin School District. And you don't need this list, right? You don't need the list of the rough terrain because you live it and you experience it and you're concerned with it because um, we're called to be <laughs> as Jesus followers. These are the very real struggles of adolescents and young people we know. And you might know also about the typical ways that um, the church responds or create space for young people to begin to understand who and where God is in the midst of their lived experiences, some of this rough terrain. Um, now, the way that churches like ours, and I'll say I'll implicate my church as well, St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Doylestown and probably Upper Dublin Lutheran Church, the way we typically do this is youth group. It's typically the program that we have. I mentioned Sunday school. That's another way that we engage young people. Um, and and it, you can think of those like the cars that Emil drives. Youth group's great. Cars are great. Emil needed a car <laughs> to get into that rough terrain, right? Uh, youth group's great because Kids can bring more than one person with them. Um, young people can be together in youth group. We can cover lots of ground. We can get from point A to point B in youth group. We can do fellowship together and Bible study together. We can learn and we can uh, engage, get outside of our school district sometimes. Sometimes there's kids from Abington High School who might be coming to your youth group in Upper Dublin and, and they're together, right? There's an opportunity to gather safely, to pray together. 
Um, but if we're honest, I think as we look in this post-pandemic moment, or at least in this season, I don't know that our traditional programming feels like it's going to cut it for addressing some of the rough terrain that young people are navigating on the regular. Um, asking people to come back into church buildings, uh, you know, engaging with, with life as we knew it pre-pandemic is... Um, is something that's providing quite a challenge for ministry leaders and has been since the onset of the pandemic. And on top of that, in 2008, we learned from the National Study of Youth and Religion that young people are leaving congregations. And that was back in 2008. And I wonder if now we're sort of hitting this time when maybe some young people never entered congregations to begin with. Um, so we're almost working from scratch. But I think, and um, Kenda goes on to say in that lecture that this is actually one of the most creative times to be in congregational ministry, to be followers of Jesus. It is a time rife with possibility and with hope. Um, so that turns us to First Chronicles. If you have a Bible handy, I would encourage you to pick it up. Imagine that, picking up a book and not just looking on a screen. Um, if you don't have a Bible handy, don't worry. I have mine handy for you. I want you to turn to First Chronicles, not the thing we typically turn to for our daily devotionals. Uh, Chronicles is a pretty boring book. If you just read it at, at its face level, there's, it chronicles things, <laughs> right? It like lists out tons of, of things. I remember reading it um, when I was in seminary and thinking, this is, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I need this like I need a hole in my head reading First Chronicles. So, but there's this really beautiful detail that I want us to pay attention to. So First Chronicles chapter 12. We're in the Old Testament, First Chronicles chapter 12. And then once you're in chapter 12, I want you to look um, around verse 23. And what's going on here is David is preparing for battle with Saul. And they're listing out basically all, they're chronicling, they're listing out all of the resources they have for this battle, including the num all, the, all the different people groups, and tribes and all of the resources that each of those people groups bring to the table. So we had this for the battle, we had this for the battle, we have this other thing for the battle. So starting at verse 23, there's all this, there's this really long boring list. And so it goes 20, verse 23, 24, 27, and you have to get all the way down to verse 32. And it just glance at the verses before it though, glance through 23, look at the kind of numbers we're working with. We've got, you know, 6,800 armed troops from Judah. The Levites are bringing 4,600 troops. There's the Benjaminites have 3,000, right? Oh my gosh, look at this. The Ephraimites have 20,800 mighty men of valor. That is a pretty great resource that David has at his disposal. All right, let's get to 32. Of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, 200 chiefs and all their kinsmen under their command. So someone thought to list the men of Issachar, 200. We're not talking big numbers here, 200. And they thought it was worth it to name that the resource that they brought to the table was understanding. Another way to think about that is wisdom. 200 people had some wisdom. And that was an incredible resource, incredible enough to list in this list of, of armies um, that David had a, at his disposal to go into battle with Saul. And I think that what that lays out for us and what we can think about when we think about innovation, sometimes it feels like a big task. It feels like, oh, I'm going to have to do a three-year journey with Princeton Seminary. It's going to be this huge thing. We're going to have to pay Princeton a bunch of money and be part of this huge program. Now, if you want to do that, talk to me. But if you don't want to do that, you don't need to. 200 people with understanding of the times. Um, some Martin, maybe a Martin Luther in your corner, you have that. <laughs> You've got that leadership in your corner already. There's two of you here today on this call, you know, who already work with young people, at least that I know of, who already work with young people. You've got lots of other tools. You could make your own list of all the other tools and resources that you have at your disposal. But wisdom is enough um, and it is a, enough to offer as a starting place for how to do this work really well. And you have already begun to cultivate wisdom today, wisdom specifically about young people who are tethered to and connected to Upper Dublin Lutheran Church through each of you who are represented here. And that's the task that you went and did. And now you have some information that you didn't have at the start of this meeting of some of the um, 
some of what's going on with these young people, right? So now, I, I, and I'll, I'll name this, I'll name this, and then we're going to go to our task results. But I want to just say that I think, um, along with my colleague Kenda, I think that this is the best opportunity that the church has had since Luther, with all the new tools we have, um, you know, our modern day versions of the printing press at our at the ready. We are the designers. We have these tools and we are at the ready to finally integrate young people, which would be a new thing for the church. Youth group and, and the traditional youth programming that we run now has been around for about a hundred years. That's how long our traditional youth ministry programming has been around for mainline uh, predominantly white congregations. It's been about a hundred years. Um, and it's probably a good time for us to, for a few new things to emerge um, through the new resources that we have since about a hundred years ago and certainly since the time of Luther. So. It's an incredibly opportunity. So I want to crack it open a bit. Whoops. Ah, we talked about this already, but I want to crack it open a bit to hear. Um, let me just toggle back to this. When you sent this text message with this image out to your people, what did you learn? And maybe I'll stop sharing actually here. What did you learn? I'd love to hear it. If there's so few of us, we can unmute and maybe just go and turn. So uh, my four kids responded, and um, I learned that one of uh, one of them is a early riser. I guess I knew this, and the other three like to sleep in. But I guess um, the 10 p.m. they were all happy in the midday, at 12 o'clock, and then at 10 p.m. it was kind of interesting. So one had kind of like a sly smile emoji, one was tired, one had like a celebration emoji, and uh, laughing emoji, like laughing with the tears. And the other one had like a, a thoughtful emoji with a monocle. So like, these are all like only one was sleepy and the rest it's kind of actually, you know, kind of deviate from the others and the other things they shared. So like that 10 o'clock time is kind of a, kind of an interesting time and knowing them well, this all lines up for me, but, um, yeah, I think that was cool. What's happening at 10 PM. Love that. Thank you, Livy. I only heard from one uh, I sent out to just a couple of families and uh, they were very sleepy at eight. Uh, they were happy with a big smile at uh, noontime and content at 10 o'clock. Kind of a content emoji, just a soft little smile. So I'm hoping to hear from some from some more kids, but looks like the best energy time was about noontime. Now, Regan, you're you're muted, and and Sally, you didn't get a chance to do this, but if you want to throw something in there, I was going to say, turn your you turn your camera on. What would you learn, if anything? Well, I just checked in with with my girls and um, had them do just the morning the morning time, and um, they picked three emo they pointed to three different emojis. Uh, they were typically happy in the mornings. Um, Brennan was. Uh, picked the one that kind of was a sideways, the sideways smile, because she's hit or miss <laughs> when she gets up. Um, but that was their response. I love it. I love it. Well, and I, it makes me wonder, you know, what are those, is it the 10 p.m. for, for you, Pastor Keith, you know, that you want to now follow up with, with your kids? And is there a conversation there that maybe wasn't there before because of this little research that project that we started to do. And then I also wonder what it would look like. What if you surveyed all of the kids who Upper Dublin Lutheran Church is called to serve, right? And then what would that mean? How would that influence maybe the next step you would take as you discern together, you know, what should we do in this season of the pandemic? What could and should we do together? Oh my gosh, 8 a.m. We definitely can't plan for them coming to Sunday school at 8 a.m. No, they're all asleep. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, but I could be wrong. You know, you could have a slew of kids who are morning people, like one of your kids is, Keith, you know? Um, and, and if so, maybe there's a breakfast club in that. I don't know, you know, but, but there's something to be said for doing some of that research and beginning to let young people invite them in in ways through the technology that's available to us, through the tools and resources we have at our fingertips, to influence how we think about our design work 
And then I wonder what the next level of that would be. Um, and I actually would love to just kind of throw it open. If you could do something in this next week, you know, I haven't given you much prep for this, but if you could do something in this next week, just maybe one thing that would help you get a bit more information that you need, learn something new or try something new um, for the young people who you are called to serve as UDLC, what, what's one idea that you have that you could do right now in this next week without doing a big long program with a seminary? <laughs> Any thoughts or ideas bubbling to the surface? Oh, Liv, you're muted. I love your idea of using emojis to get some answers because it's very non-threatening. Yeah. It doesn't require a lot of work and it doesn't require too much thinking before mm -hmm. the answer. It gives you a gut reaction, mm -hmm. which I think is also a helpful thing. We can dig a little more deeply once we get some of those gut reactions, I believe, but just to, just to tell us, where are you at this time of day? Or we could use emojis. Uh, we could send out some emojis of people doing different things and uh, you know, which emoji relates most to you. So, I see that being helpful. Looking, um, our youth director is not here right now. He's not able to be, but I know he's going to tune in later. But um, thinking of the Sunday school and um, and the time of Sunday school, and um, and you know, and what is Sunday school going to look like? That's really one of my big focuses. Um, and so, I would like to send out something like that, fun and easy for kids to do, even for kids who are little, um, I mean, I could send them a, like a postcard with different emojis and ask them just to circle it mm -hmm. and, then bring, and then bring it back to church. You know, mm -hmm. we can talk about it, bring it back and we'll have a, you know, we'll have a scavenger hunt or something like we, we did yesterday. We had a successful thing outside with kids, but I really love that idea of the emoji because when you ask kids to start putting a lot of verbiage to it, number one, it really leaves out a lot of children who have maybe have some special needs who are not such good readers or not or they're not so good at expressing themselves but pretty much anybody can take an emoji and, and and put a circle around it so i love that and i will work on doing something like that this week that, that'll be a fun thing i'll talk to keith about it first so he doesn't think i'm going crazy i don't want to go rogue on you keith i don't want to go rogue on you. <laughs> i love that i love that and um you know, thinking about this, you know, how, when we look at what happened to Emil, um, that's going back to that story. And when he took that car in the desert, I think one of the questions we can ask ourselves in this season of the pandemic is how much do we need this? If, if the car again is our youth ministry programming, whether that's Sunday school or youth group, how much do we need this thing to look like a car when it comes back from that rough terrain? Can we allow it um, to still have that in, those important component parts? Maybe it's really important for us to gather in some way. It's important for us to, to integrate biblical reflection because gosh darn it, we're the church, you know, and the tribe of Issachar matters. <laughs> those 200 men and their wisdom and understanding of the times matter. And we're going to list the small things. The small things matter to us. Um, and I, I'm not naming that the Bible and biblical reflection is a small thing, right? I, I think that's a pretty big thing, but but that those those component parts, there's so many elements to youth group, to Sunday school that that matter, but maybe we can really reconfigure it. Um, and this is our opportunity to really reconfigure it and still have it be ministry. Um, and then in your 2.0 and your 3.0, your young people are asking um, not so young people to give their emojis and real community is forming. And then you're going out and you're walking around your neighborhood and you're figuring out what emojis your neighborhood would embody. And you're, you know, you're engaging in your community and you're cultivating belonging in new ways. Um, all right, so I promised you a homework assignment. I'm gonna leave you that. I'm gonna actually just grab a link here and throw it into our chat box. So this is a link to um, a podcast that we host and run out of the Institute for Youth Ministry. And the episode that I would love for y'all to listen to is episode number six. It's called Still Abiding. It's about Abiding Presence Lutheran Church 
not too dissimilar from Upper Dublin Lutheran Church, certainly in that it's Lutheran, its context is decidedly different. Um, they're in Burke, Virginia, they're outside of Washington, DC. Um, but I think that there will still be enough ties that bind. Um, you will get to hear a little bit more about their work with us through the Log College Project, which you're now familiar with. And you'll get to learn um, a little bit about what got them thinking outside of the box uh, around, around youth ministry and how they're doing it in this season. So I, I find it's really good to leave with like a, here's one, here's one way, even if it's not the way you end up going, here's one way that another Lutheran church is doing something differently. Um, and it's deeply impacted by COVID and the rough terrain that the young people in their context are experiencing. Um, so that's what I have. Uh, Pastor Keith, I don't know if you want me to pray us out or you to, I can hand it over to you and you tell me uh, what you want to do at this point, but it's been a joy to be with you today. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Abigail. Like, woof, this is awesome. It's like so rich. Um, and I can't wait to listen to the podcast. And then um, I just, you know, what's cool about um, Princeton IYM and, and what you do, what Kenda does, it's, it's not only, it's, it's inviting us to a different way of thinking um, about how we do what we do and why we do what we do. And um, we experienced some of that in the Zoe project and, and I can see that in the Log Cabin project and, and what you're inviting us into um, and how to dream and iterate and, you know, no, we're not going to have the answer first off the bat. So we can continue to, um, you know, kind of respond and, and adjust and, and move on, you know, move ahead. So I think um, we're certainly feeling that, you know, post, post pandemic um, and in other ways, like, you know, trying just to figure out what does ministry look like now? That's why we're doing this series, you know? And so, so many of the things you shared also, I think, translate into other areas of ministries as well. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, why don't I, uh, oh, did you want to say something? No. Okay. All right. Uh, why don't I pray us out? Good and gracious God, we thank you for this ministry to which you have called us. And, um, though this season can be one that is challenging and very new for us and filled with, um, questions, curiosity, uncertainty, wonderings, uh, and it can feel a little, uh, disruptive. It is also a time of great opportunity. So we actually count ourselves so fortunate to be in this time, to be ministering in this time. And we trust that you have called us to this time with our whole selves and our full selves that we were meant to be here. And so we pray that you would help us to understand why and how. And um, I thank you for wise leaders like Abigail and her department that are equipping and empowering those of us who serve in parishes um, to really make the most of this time, to be open to the possibilities of this time, and uh, to dream and to vision. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a gift to hang out with the most fun mainliners who are Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just, just awesome. I'm, um, and I will, uh, I'll just turn off, the I'll remember to turn off the recording.